say good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm really happy to be here. This is a great chapter, and I look forward to learning from you guys. And I'd like to kick it off. And this is this is a great opportunity for me because it allows me to do something that I've wanted to do, which is to step out of my day-to-day -day individual project, individual small, you know, focused project, and look at the bigger picture, and ask the scary question. Is there anything coherent about what we're doing? Okay. <laughs> and I think the answer is yes. We'll, you'll, we'll see what you think. So what I'd like to do is you know, provide kind of an overview. And, and you know, we're focusing on brook trout. We're focusing on cold water fisheries, primarily rivers and streams, southern Appalachia and central Appalachia is where I'm focused. But my intent is and my hope is that the general framework I lay out or the, the principles I lay out will be useful for you no matter what system or place you're working on. We'll see. Um, you know, it's been said that you know, all fisheries biologists, all fisheries ecologists will be climate change researchers at some point. I think that might unfortunately be true at some level. So hopefully these principles will be germane for you. So, you know, brook trout is an iconic species. We know the life history diversity, salters, coasters, inland, resident, we, migratory populations. This is an amazing thing, ecologically very important, but culturally, we also know very important, culturally, economically, uh, this drives a lot of the work that we're doing. So it's, a, it's an iconic species, uh, and we're interested in it for many different reasons. We also know that the trends are bad, okay? We look across the range. Of course, this is the, the Appalachian side. We're excluding some of the populations further west, but in the native range in the Appalachian Mountains, mostly reduced populations, okay? So this is due to several things. We know that the drivers are interacting. They're complicated, but this is the overall pattern Let's dig into why. And I'd like to give you three main things. First, a unifying framework. Okay, we're going to put all of these little puzzle pieces into some larger context. And that's what I hope is going to be useful for you in, in whatever ever system or, or, or tax on you're working. Then I'll make the <laughs> conclusion that we, we know a lot about some pieces of this puzzle. We know very little about other pieces. And unfortunately, the pieces that we know the least about tend to be potentially the most fundamentally important. So that's a challenge for us. And then I'll, I'll conclude by talking about some forward-looking pers perspectives. Um, how do we get big data? I mean, motivate that need. How do we get big data? And how do we engage the public in a new way? We have ideas on this, and I look forward to your feedback. So that's the, over that's the overview. All right. So you know, I'll be drawing on some of our lab's work from field studies, uh, from uh, landscape ecology, you know, what's your context and space and time. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the work. I manage an experimental stream facility at the Lee Town Science Center where we do all sorts of manipulative work, glorified fish torture, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it's for science. Uh, I'll talk about some more modeling and simulation work, you know, so I'm drawing on a whole bunch of different kinds of studies, and I'll also be talking about some of our crowdsourcing and citizen science work. We need to go big, and we'll get into that at the end. Okay, so here's a framework. Nice <laughs> blank slate, right? What could go wrong? Um, a framework for how we think about all the pieces of the puzzle in climate change research. This is one that I think has a lot of utility. NatureServe uses this approach. Other states use this approach. I think it captures everything that, that we need to be thinking about and, and helps us contextualize our, our piece of the puzzle here. First, exposure, right? How, are, how and, and where will conditions change? Second, sensitivity. Okay. Think about populations. Which populations you know, will respond to those changes? And, and third, adaptive capacity. And spoiler alert, this is the one that's probably the most important and least understood. Um, so will evolutionary change, will selection keep pace with environmental changes? And if so, where? Now, so there's a lot of... There's a lot of uh, fundamental research going on here, okay? We've got to appreciate this. Fundamental principles. Hydrology, geophysics, physiology, ecology, population dynamics, evolutionary ecology, and uh, genetics, genomics. We'll be touching on these. Now, that's the sort of interactive model we're going to use. Um, it, it's a heuristic. I mean, look, there's nothing, there's nothing sacred about any of these conceptual models. I think there's utility, right, to help us understand how things interact in the spaces. But, there are other ways to frame which you could think about, you know, others have thought about exposure being the fundamental principle uh, and leading up to adaptive capacity, or conversely, adaptive capacity being the overall framework leading up to these other principles. But there's nothing sacred about these. 
you can you can take a model, you can flip it upside down, you can put another model in it, you got a martini. <laughs> and I know this is AFS, but it's only nine o'clock, so <laughs> even for y'all. All right, so this is what we're gonna use. So we know that air temperatures are increasing, right? That that's empirically true. The fourth climate assessment showed this. We also know that there are heat response thresholds, 20 degrees. We're talking about native brook trout, 23, 25. Okay, so that's what we know. And by the way, I can update this. Just uh, two days ago, our European colleagues produced this map. Uh, unfortunately, January 2020 uh, was an anomalously hot uh, year. We're breaking records. This January, at the global scale, Europe and Eastern North America in particular. So it's continuing. Key assumption is that this effect of air temperature will be spatially uniform across space. Well, that's not universally true. We know this because groundwater is patchy. It's patchy in space and time. We have to be able to account for this. It acts as a buffer for air temperature increases. How do we do that? Well, there, you know, the right way to do it would be to build a heat budget model. We're not going to do that everywhere. <coughs> so what we could do, and this is something I want you to think about, we can estimate groundwater influence from simple empirical air-water temperature relationships. We can gauge these things with inexpensive hobos, and then we can look at the variation. This gray line here is invariant air temperature, black. That's a groundwater site. That's low exposure to air temperature change. That's high resiliency. That's thermal resiliency on the landscape. And vice versa, right? High correspondence. We see tightly dovetailed uh, air and water temperature relationships. That's a low groundwater site. That's high exposure. And then we can go further. And then we can use those empirical observations in space to estimate unsampled space based on landform features. Right? The features that control bedrock, uh, groundwater, surface water interaction. Landform features do predict this to some degree, which is exciting because then we can develop spatial models. These are 100 meter prediction points. And we can see things that we could never see at the USGS gauges. Now, I love USGS gauges, and that's not just because of my bias. It's because they're really useful. But they measure things in places where it doesn't represent the habitat complexity that we know exists out there on the landscape. For example, this is a stream in Shenandoah National Park, Virginia. And we see there is a groundwater refugia. There is a groundwater upwelling site that dominates stream temperature. We would never capture that in the downstream gauge. So we need to be thinking about spatially structured networks. And we can predict those with landform features. And then we can put them to use. So this is a URL you can check out, Chesapeake USGS Gov fish forecast. And in this, we allow users to manipulate scenarios of both air temperature change and groundwater sensitivity to air temperature change. That puts those two pieces together. And we think this does a better job of accounting for variation in exposure, right? It does a better job of accounting for local resiliency on the landscape, and that's important for climate change. And for example, here you can see these red sites are unsuitable, blue sites are suitable in a future scenario. Key point is sites in the headwaters become unsuitable before sites further downstream. It's not simply a uh, marching upstream. It's not just a systematic loss of habitat in upstream direction. We're anticipating fragmentation, thermal fragmentation, which is an important concept to think about in many stream systems and also in, in lake and, and the river systems. Okay, so analogously, stream dewatering. Hey, look, we can predict temperature for places, but there's no water there, right? We've got to think about this equivalently. Groundwater is a part of this. I'm not going to really go into depth, but I can just say that Climate change exposure is patchy, and we have to we have new methods to account for this. So let's switch to sensitivity. Okay, <coughs> think about pop the most basic population dynamics model. Okay, so the principles underneath this are you know what we work on: the survival, recruitment, reproduction rates. Okay, so now let's think about which populations are going to be sensitive to abiotic or biotic changes. A main inference from years and years of brook trout work is that. Look, if you look at abundance of adults in year T versus the abundance of offspring in year T plus one, there's no pattern, okay? No stock recruitment relationship, all right? That's a challenge. We can't predict recruitment based on the number of, of breeders in, in year T. That's an important challenge for us. However, overwinter survival, uh, juveniles in year T do predict uh, abundance in year T plus one. What this means is that it's abiotic factors. We can home in on which one of those factors really drives the boat. For juvenile abundance, right, young of the year, fish, we see again and again different data sets showing this pointing to the same direction. Winter precip, 
So here is uh, results of a Bayesian model. Basically, anything below zero is a negative association with Yoy abundance. The big hammer is winner preset. As that goes up, young of the year go down. What's the mechanism? It's scour and larval and egg mortality. So that's an important piece of the puzzle. It's not biotic regulation. It's abiotic. And it's not just abiotic. It's winner preset. <coughs> so we can home in on the factors that we think matter the most for this population dynamics perspective. And I'll also point out, this is the one parameter that all of the Northeast climate forecast models agree on. Look, some predict increasing air temperature, some predict, well, I should say, some predict increasing spring rain, some predict decreasing spring, spring rain. You average all those models out, it's hard to know what to do with that. But all models, the consensus view is winter precip and more rain on snow and more you know, precip as rain is in our future in the northeastern U.S. <coughs> high confidence in that assessment, and amazingly, that's, we have high confidence in the response. Now, it's not just one bad year we care about, and this is a modeling exercise. I have to credit my co-authors here for this work. You have Cano at Colorado State, uh, Ben Letcher at UMass, and others. <coughs> we collaborated on this, and when we estimate the sort of sequentialness of different high-flow events, what we see is that where extreme events, such as winter high precip years, are rare, well, one bad, quote unquote, bad year out of, out of many, no big deal. In fact, it's probably a quote unquote good thing, right? Because density dependent growth, you're kind of thinning out that population, individual growth goes up, overwinter survival grows up, goes up, and then you have stability in population. But this is the key point where you get high winter precip events every year. <coughs> you see extirpations. In other words, it's not just the presence of extreme events, but it's the sequentialness of those extreme events year to year. That's something to think about. And I think that framework has relevance in, in lake ecosystems, and certainly river and stream ecosystems. Okay, so still on the sensitivity component, I'll just mention a couple of other papers that have influenced our thinking about this. We looked at the interaction of brown and brook trout in an experimental lab setting as a function of groundwater availability. So we manipulated ambient temperatures and groundwater refugia, and what we found is something very interesting for native brook trout. It has implications for native brooks. Basically, in the absence of brown trout, brook trout used warmer waters. They were able to periodically access those warmer waters for foraging, and we think this is interesting because we can't necessarily manage air temperatures <coughs> Right. But we can manage the presence or absence of brown trout in some of these stream systems. It's a, it's a management tool available to, to us that we think could increase the, the resiliency uh, or decrease the sensitivity of these native brook trout populations. And it's something to think about because climate change will interact with invasive species or introduced species. I know brown trout have huge value. But uh, if the objective is native brook trout conservation, this is something to think about. We can expand the, the res climate resiliency of these fish by manipulating their competitors. This is actually work that Maryland DNR and our lab are collaborating on. We're doing some experimental removals of brown trout to, to try to understand this effect. Another perspective on sensitivity from our lab work in Journal of Fish Biology this year, Shannon White is the lead author. You know, we saw that body size has a huge effect, and unfortunately, it was the, and this makes some sense from a bioenergetics perspective, it was the largest fish that required the thermal refuge most. So, the spatial distribution of these thermal patches that I showed in the exposure view might have more relevance for big fish. And that's an important concept when we think about, you know, sport fish management. It's also something we're following up on uh, at a national project with uh, USGS colleagues in the Rockies and the Pacific Northwest and the Desert Southwest, something to stay tuned for. All right, so let's switch to the third category here, adaptive capacity. And I'll just reference uh, some work by Dave Kazak and company um, in the Southern Appalachians. Here we're talking about the, the Blue Ridge Spine here, uh, many sites. Key inferences are that, you know, we see relatively low intergression with hatchery stock fish. Same species, but they're not intergressing at random. It's not random mating. And this suggests the potential for local adaptation. This suggests it's either prezygotic, well, it indicates it's either prezygotic isolating mechanisms, they're not breeding together, or when they're either they're all ripe at the same time, they're choosing different individuals, or they ripen at different times, we don't know, 
but for one reason or another, it's not random. So this gives us some hope there is the potential for local adaptation in these systems. There's still a lot of open space there for research, as I'll, as I'll mention. But our lab undertook this question in an experimental design uh, by looking at a couple of key places. Now, this is the state of Maryland. Western Maryland, high elevation, it's cold. Eastern Maryland, this is actually in the Piedmont, and it's low elevation, and it is hot. Amazingly, there are native brook trout hanging on by a thread. This is the gunpowder river system. If there's any place where there's going to be local adaptation to heat stress, this is one of those places. We've seen extirpations across the rest of the range in the Piedmont. They exist here. Did, they, did the roll of the dice produce <laughs> a winning scenario for heat tolerance? We wanted to understand that. So we pulled fish into the, the experimental stream lab. We can see that you know, empirically, these sites are different. Now, this is an example year. You know, the sites to the east in the low elevation Gunpowder River, they were well above 20 C. We know that's a threshold, physiological threshold for cortisol expression. Fish move at that point. So it's, it's a real uh, ecological threshold as well as a round number. I, I always love that. So we introduced these fish into, into the system. We asked, okay, look, common garden design, are they exhibiting any functional differences? Now, I should say, like every experiment, it doesn't go the way you think it will. Our original intent was to breed out F1s to get another generation and to evaluate the F1s. <coughs> Didn't work quite like that, which is interesting in its own way. I can talk about that later. But it did get, allow us a chance after acclimation periods. Look at adult behavior and adult use of habitat in this context. And we can see that some things are plastic. Some things we see no evidence for genetic diversity. It's body shape. So we can think about representing body shape among some populations in a multivariate space. And basically at the beginning they were more different than they were at the end. Right? So that, that suggests that maybe there are local differences attributed to hydraulics or other features of these different locations. But give them time in a common environment, they're going to converge. So it's not really genetically determined. Probably. But there are other aspects of these populations that really blew our minds. This is very, this is exactly the same kind of environmental feature in a stream lab, but yet very different expression of behavior and habitat use. Movement rates, different among local populations. Habitat use, different among local populations. Um, and so it's very intriguing. It suggests the potential, it opens the door to local adaptation. Doesn't prove it because, look, this could just be long-term sort of acclimation effects playing out over time. But it's consistent with that idea and it's something that I see a real need for a follow-up work on. But when we look at the big picture here on the adaptive capacity component, there's, there have been a handful of studies focusing on this key question from a genetics and genomics perspective. Not many from a uh, functional perspective as we've looked at it. But still, there are huge questions out here. One is, does it really matter? I mean, we know empirically that brook trout and coastal cutthroat trout and all sorts of salmons have persisted in small populations above waterfalls for many years. Now, granted, we don't see what's extirpated, but it's tetraploidy. Truthfully, maybe that perfect, protects them from small population sizes. You know, double the copies of genomes, less effect of bottlenecks. It's possible, and maybe that's evolutionarily, you know, a, sort of a winning strategy in some cases. Another fundamental question here, you know, we look at things with mi microsatellite loci, these are neutral markers, they're not selecting, they're not uh, selected upon, they're an index of things that we assume are selected upon. Now there's, of course, a revolution in genomics, which can get at functional expression, but that connection has not been fully made at this point. We know there's, you know, variation in space in, in microsatellite loci, in sort of the genetic the population genetic structure, how does that link specifically to function? It's a big open question. So I look forward to you know, learning from you all on that work as well. And the big question is, you know, do the costs of isolation, small population size, are they, are they compensated for by the potential benefits of local adaptation? If you think about brook trout being highly fragmented, well that's a double-edged sword, right? It cuts one way, small population size effects, we know how that goes. But it might cut the other because each of these small populations is a, is a roll of the dice. And it's an opportunity for local adaptation. That's a big picture question. So I'm going to step back out to the 
overall framework, you know, I've given you a, a highly biased view based on my last work of how we factor into these different pieces of the puzzle. But we can see learning on each one of these, each one of these levels. And, and specifically, you know, what, what did we learn here? On the exposure side, <clears throat> well, we need to think about groundwater, all right? We need to think about spatial patchiness. Because there's resiliency on the landscape, we have to account for it. And that's actually kind of a good news story for climate change research. It's rare, but one of those good news stories, there is resiliency on the landscape, we need to account for that, all right? On sensitivity, well, we've seen that environmental changes affect some um, aspects of the population dynamic more than others, and specifically winter flow, yois, and sequential year-to-year -year effects of high winter flows. That's one to watch. Okay. That's one to watch. When we think about extreme weather and how extreme events aren't as uncommon anymore, that's one to watch. On adaptive capacity, our common garden work uh, are, you know, are consistent with this idea <coughs> of local, the potential for local adaptation at the spatial scale of, of Maryland, okay? Doesn't conclusively demonstrate that. To do so, we would need to breed out the next generation, evaluate the offspring of that to control for, for a phenotypic expression. Um, and that, that's a huge area for ongoing research. And it's one that I would, I would argue is probably the least understood and potentially the most important. So, switch gears a little bit, let's look ahead. I've talked about a uh, science model for how we think about climate change vulnerability. And I hope that has utility for you. I think a lot of different systems and places can plug into that framework. Um, but it's not enough. Everybody knows this. You know, for one thing, on a technical side, we need big data, right? We can motivate this, for example, from the exposure perspective. If we're not collecting observations at many, space, many spaces in this stream network, then we're going to miss patterns. We're going to miss that resiliency. So we need big data in space. We need big data in time. No institution, no single agency, AFS, you know, notwithstanding, I think we realize that no institution or agency or university can do that work by itself. We need to think big about crowdsourcing, about, about <coughs> engaging the public in this effort. And of course it has other benefits. So I'd like to talk about our effort in that regard, Project eTrout. Um, the idea here is to use some new technology in, in 360 imagery to both get the big data that we need, by say big, I mean many, many sites, observations over space, and to engage the public in that process. This is a proof of concept, right? But I'll tell you, this is a lot more accessible than it was. This is a 360 fly camera. They're waterproof. They're good for backcountry field work, um, a lot of memory, 4K resolution imagery. It's good, and it's cheap. So now, we can create these, put a little tripod, a weighted tripod on there, and distribute them to the public, get spatial data, and to estimate things we care about, like brook trout abundance. So that was our proof of concept. Here's some imagery from a, a sample site. You can see that you know, there are some, and it's kind of grainy here, but the main thing is that you can see diagnostic features with this imagery, 4K stuff. Now granted, fish further in the view are going to be more challenging, but you can see adipose fins and leading fin margin, so you can use this for, in the trout world, the salmonosphere, you can, you can use this. The question we've asked is, 